Hey everyone, welcome to the That's Allowed podcast. This is your hostess, Audrienne McKeon. And today I am here with Pamela Slim. Please, Pam, introduce yourself. Well, thanks for having me. I am Pamela Slim, and I am an author and a speaker and a business coach and the co-founder of the Main Street Learning Lab in which I am sitting today, the co-founder with my husband, Daryl. Fabulous. And I had Pam on because I heard a podcast uh, that she was doing with another podcaster that I work with. And I was just so incredibly impressed with her wisdom and her vulnerability and her just authenticity and realness. So I absolutely had to have her on here. And I'm so glad that she has come to join us today. So super happy to do it. Thank you for being here, Pam. So the question I usually start with, in fact, I've started a new question, (laughs) is my question I usually start with, (laughs) Mm -hmm. is what story is the world not getting? To me, it is the realization that we really do need each other. Any kind of significant change that we want to make, and for me, my lens is generally around small business, around community economic development. Um, I don't think people see how beneficial it can be when we get to know each other, when we share the mission of of growing our businesses, being here right on Main Street in Mesa, Arizona, where our our learning lab is. Um, It's amazing for those that really sense that whenever we visit each other's businesses and find out what each other is doing, there's a natural way in which we want to support and connect with each other. And it's always interesting I, I, to see examples of like a different kind of reaction, which I think is just socialized for a lot of folks who have the, the point of view that everyone does things for themselves and it's just really up to me to build my own empire. Um, clearly, I have a point of view that's different on that. If it works for some people, that's great. Not everybody has to be collective, really a collective, but the more that we see that we do need each other, the more benefit I think for everybody in so many different ways. You're not as lonely, you have more opportunities, there are more referrals. When you might hit a bump in the road, there is somebody there who can catch you and can carry you over the puddle (laughs) if need be and vice versa. I just feel like it's a much more healthy and uh, joyful way to live. Well, of course, I completely agree. First of all, (laughs) collaboration is where it's at. It's what it's all about for me. But I also think the audience who's listening, I know we have a lot of women out there who are starting new careers or starting uh, their own businesses now, uh, later in life. And I think they're starting to realize that they don't have to be a one woman show. They don't have to do it all themselves. So do you have some ideas about, you know, suggestions you could give tools, tricks, things like this for women who are feeling like they have to do it all alone? I think one is just recognizing um, some systemic issues often that are in play where if folks come from more of a corporate environment where that was very familiar to me, I was a, a worked in corporate. I was a corporate consultant for 10 years before I started to work with people to leave and start a business. My first book was Escape from Cubicle Nation. So there was a lot of um, familiarity that I had with people who were coming from that environment. And there's a real socialization in many corporate environments, not all, but that there are really specific reasons why you need to behave in such a way to share and to tell everybody else that you indeed are doing everything yourself because sometimes you can be (laughs) penalized for like not doing your job where you might have a specific sales goal if you're a salesperson or you have your initiatives you need to get done if you're collaborating with another department and none of that is reflected on your performance review we can really be pretty strongly systematically socialized to just focus on that which you can control and to believe that you can just do it yourself. Now, people often can work in a team environment and I know I had a lot of really positive experiences within corporate, so it's not like that doesn't exist, Mm -hmm. but it generally is a much more narrow lens of how it is that you look at work and you don't, especially if you come from any kind of marginalized identity, it's not really safe in order to be showing vulnerability. 
and to be expressing yeah. the fact that you are not able to do it all yourself. So I know for a lot of my clients who might be black women or native women or folks that, that might come from a more marginalized identity within corporate environments, uh, it's pretty bad advice <laughs> to tell them to yeah. be vulnerable, to show that they're not in control. Once you begin to shift out and you work in, uh, in entrepreneurship or you start to work for yourself, then depending on what you're doing, there is a whole different way of being. And it can just take a while to know that you can trust other people. You want to be discerning in terms of how it is that you build your circle. But um, it, there are so many things that you have to know. There are so many challenges and difficulties along the way that it just makes the process so much easier. And I, I often refer to the, the process of escaping cubicle nation and, and going into entrepreneurship, like yeah. going through that wardrobe in Narnia yeah. <laughs> or the magic door <laughs> where it's really impossible for you to see it before you go. It's mm. hard to believe that the world is any different. But once you do cross over, all of a sudden you're like, wow, like things can operate very differently here than what I was used to. And it's, it's sometimes hard to describe until you actually have that experience. That's a really good point. I know your second book is about uh, uh, using some of those things that you've learned for people who uh, are not necessarily entrepreneurs, right? Mm -hmm. So how can you, if you are still in a corporate environment, start to, like you said, maybe showing vulnerability is not a good plan mm -hmm. <laughs> necessarily, um, but how can you start to take more control over your career and just be a little more mindful about the ways that you are presenting yourself? The, yeah, the, one of the reasons I wrote Body of Work was because I noticed after doing so much work in early stage entrepreneurship at Escape from Cubicle Nation that as that sector grew, because I, I started my blog in 2005 and the book came out in 2009. So it was just, yeah. it, was, it was earlier on now, which is exciting. There are so many people who are doing work in that space that it just seems like it's always been there. But back in those <laughs> days, it wasn't as common to be talking about side hustles and, and doing this. And so... What I found is that a lot of people were becoming so overzealous about entrepreneurship that they were saying you can only be creative and free if you work for yourself. And I do not believe that to be true. Yeah. My brother and sister-in-law are, are academics. They teach at the University of Pittsburgh. My dad worked for a company, a public utility for his whole career and had a rich, creative, rewarding career as a photographer. There are many other examples of that. And ironically, when people are entrepreneurs and they grow and scale their business, like who are the people who work for you? <laughs> are they the creative uninspired sheep that you're always talking about? <laughs> like, no, they're people who are choosing to work in an environment that you really enjoy. So, so really as a, a shift of focus in that, I tried to think of as somebody who's been in the field of generally career development, professional development for 30 years, what could be a metaphor in a way that we could be looking at our work in our careers that would encompass work that we do in different ways, in different work modes? Because some yeah. people by force or by choice um, will leave corporate to start a business because they want to. Sometimes they get laid off, they don't want to, but as soon as they can, they might veer back in and take a lot of other you know, twists. So the focus to me is really that the purpose of our life is to create a body of work that we are very proud of. Mm -hmm. And our body of work is everything we create, contribute, affect, and impact throughout mm -hmm. the course of our life. So when you think about it that way, there are very specific applications within corporate life where you are discerning, thinking about the kinds of projects that you do wanna get involved with. How can you not just be thinking about your work as a paycheck and something that you have to do, but really a chance to be building something in a creative way. And I know when I, my last real job in 1996 at Barclays Global Investors, where I was the director of training, I had so much fun talking with people from all kinds of different departments. I would go on the trading floor and talk to the traders once the markets closed. I was so fascinated by that world that I knew nothing about. I would go and talk to the legal department and just people from all different backgrounds. And when you're approaching your workplace as a place that has a rich community of, of really smart people, of which is the case for many organizations, 
then you can really be discerning about what kinds of projects that you want to work on. And even when there is, there are some things outside of your control um, about what you have to be involved with, it's surprising sometimes for some clients I've worked with that are in corporate that you actually can sometimes get away with more than you would think of. Um, the, my, one of my past clients, Ben Fanning, who's just a dear friend, he um, wrote a book called The Quit Alternative. And that's really about how people who, at first he was trying to help people leave like I did with mine. And then he was like, wait a minute, he was actually still in a corporate job and noticed that he was able to shift a lot about the way that he did work. So it was much more aligned with what he wanted to do. And his passion became doing that work within organization. So I think there can be more flexibility sometimes than you think of, but always remember you're not going to be often judged by your seniority, how many years you've been somewhere, who it is necessarily that you know in your network because people can be let go, can, that can change in an instant. I've seen Absolutely. it so many times, but what you can always point to is your body of work. What projects have you been involved mm -hmm. with? What is your point of view? What is that contribution? And that's something that you can always take with you and share as you progress in your career. And how do you think people can put more emphasis onto teamwork and collaboration, regardless of the kind of culture that they happen to be in? I think it um, it is a it is a choice to let's see. It sort of has a couple layers to it because yeah. I think there has to be a personal motivation of recognizing that a lot of growth and professional development is going to come through stretching and working with other people and creating like collaborative and innovative solutions. Mm -hmm. I do know many really brilliant people who might identify as being more introverted, who really love doing that deep, like maven work as um, Malcolm Gladwell talked about in the tipping point, you know, where yeah. they love being in that joy zone of really going in and doing deep work, which I think is, is so beneficial and wonderful. So there's a range, I think, of what people's desire is for collaboration. Mm -hmm. But even if you do have really a deep body of work that you are focused on developing as the primary creator, you still need to get that work out into the world so that it can do things with other people, usually. If you're doing research, if you're you know, building an app, whatever it is that you do, there is a point in the development process where you need to be getting input from other people, from potential users, from you know, collaborators, marketers, salespeople. And so I think finding the, the points in your work where you recognize you might feel limited, where you look at the goal that you have for your work. And what I find sometimes for clients that have a little bit of a, what I call a smaller wingspan, they don't, they're, mm -hmm. they're not necessarily wanting to have a gigantic net of people, but, um, it is analyzing it through the context of, of what is that wish and that goal you have for the work. If you want the work to get it more out in the world, generally it involves connecting with more people. It's hard to do it all yourself. Well, and getting different perspectives, it sounds like too. Yeah, where again, it, somebody has to have the personal desire to do that. So it, that's <laughs> I think that's really the, the intention. And I, I very much come from the point of view that there's no one right way to be. Um, there's ways I think that we look at the myriad of ways in which we're messed up <laughs> at the moment <laughs> and we're in so much pain and we're just struggling yeah. and disconnected that you know I, I think we can all see and probably feel what it's like if we don't feel like we're connected and we need each other on a pretty fundamental level. But, um, but besides that, you know, in the context of work, it is looking at it through the lens of more of a growth mindset yeah. um, in the Carol Dweck's book mindset kind of context, mm -hmm. you know, where you really do want to grow and expand. You want to question your assumptions. You want to look at how you can take your work further. And so where you have that lens, then you need other people. Yeah, that's interesting. I do feel like when I am not really aligned properly and I'm not doing work that's really in line with, you know, my passions, I find myself feeling like I need more external validation and like I need mm. to, you know, to work with other people to tell me, hey, am I doing this right? <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Yeah. 
whereas when you become more self-directed, I think that becomes less important, but more fun to work with other people as equals, if that makes sense. Yeah. It, I always, you can tell, I can think in models because that's part of how I like look at the world, but there's, yeah. there, there could be different components. I think for the, I think of Dan Pink's book drive about the three drivers for meaning um, and purpose yeah. is well, autonomy, mastery, and purpose is the mm -hmm. thing that can give us motivation to do work. What's interesting when you look at autonomy is I don't necessarily think that he meant like just totally being by yourself but having the ability to control the creative process and, and have some of the decision-making around how it is that you do work. So there's that, that depth of mastery and what it is that you're doing and feeling a connection that your work does have meaning. And so that could be that piece where you say that if you're not really feeling the meaning, you're needing to get some external ideas about like, does this really mean anything? And why does it matter? And, and to, to feel that connection to purpose. There's another model uh, my friend Charlie Gilkey talks about, which is the um, cre uh, create, connect, and consume, which are the three parts of the creative circle. He, he write, his book was called Start Finishing, and he writes a lot about and works with people like I do that are creative entrepreneurs. And when you think about what a specific piece of your body of work needs in order to be formed, there is often the consuming research, you know, information, looking at different places for, you know, ideas. There can be the connection with other people to share, get feedback on ideas. And then there's that zone where you really just need to sit down and create it. That's, um, and so each person I think can have a little different um, appetite for the, for the connection. As a big extrovert, for me, I love it. I love to talk about ideas. It gets me really excited. I'm currently writing a book, so I need to be sitting my ass down and typing on the keyboard. <laughs> like that's what I'm like. <laughs> it is time to create, but I but I noticed like in the last two books, it helps me. Sometimes it's a distraction, but for the most part, it helps me when I'm writing. When I might have an idea that I want to check, and I'll quickly go on Facebook and say, "Hey, what do you all think about this?" Like, yes. if you had to choose between these two ideas, which one would it be? That could give me a little shot of connection that then helps me to come back in the create mode. If it doesn't suck me down a rabbit hole for an hour, uh -huh. looking at funny cat memes on Facebook <laughs> or something like that. No, I can relate to that so hard. So I'm, I'm working on a book right now too. And I have the same thing where I need that kind of instant feedback. I, I'm an actress. And so it can be hard for me to not get the applause right away. <laughs> yes. And so, yeah, I mean, social media is wonderful for that. Just to get that, that instant hive mind hit of yes. response and and collaboration so that's one for of the sure. things i think it's it's good for <laughs> that's right but each person needs to just design it the way that works for them in the flow yeah. and yeah i have just noted i i often use it with clients where they may not be very comfortable or they may not have you know as large of an audience yeah and so we can be on a call and they're like oh, i don't really know about these two you know different ideas and i'm like do you want me to ask and so during the call just go put something out quickly. Yeah. And um, it's really, it's just one of my favorite things. I love to collaborate with, with my community when I'm creating things because it's for them. So it, I need to right. get their input <laughs> to make sure <laughs> yeah. that it's, it's useful. Absolutely. That's wonderful. So I know you've traveled a lot. Mm -hmm. You have been in a lot of different cultural contexts. So how do you think our cultural context in the United States compares kind of globally in terms of encouragement to collaborate or work in teams? Uh, the big question first is who is we and who is ours? So for us Fair. as you know, white women could be <laughs> yeah, yeah. very, very different from my mm -hmm. husband's Navajo culture. Um, we have so many subcultures within our country that I think it absolutely that can reflect really so many different cultures around the world absolutely um, if we look at kind of the dominant narrative the social narrative about you know the mainly white male version of american culture in the way that that often is that we're socialized around in business they tend to be the kind of models that we look at a lot sometimes the way that we're socialized within academia then that very much is the pull yourself up by the bootstraps, you know, I can do it all myself. 
asking for help is weakness. Um, in the business world, I call, one of the reasons why I'm writing this next book is um, noticing the pattern of the empire culture. So we use a lot of words around empires and building empires when we're talking about building our business. And I just find it really fascinating to use that specific language when you think about what empires have done. It's great when you're at the top of the empire. Uh-huh. <laughs> it's not so great if you're building the empire or often you're under the foot of it. Mm-hmm. And so that I find it really fascinating that so many of those metaphors are used within business about you know crushing it and building an empire <laughs> and the you know your competition or your enemies. And that's often, again, where I see, I mean, I'm, I, I'm a competitive person. I grew up doing martial arts and I uh, am the first one to hopefully respectfully, you know, yell at the soccer field as my son is playing. Like, I, li- I like to be competitive. There's a, <laughs> there's a good juice to pushing myself into seeing like people that are excelling at what they're doing that are challenging themselves to grow, like in a team environment. There's, there's, there's nothing wrong with that feeling, but it's different when you make a competitor become your enemy or when you become myopic saying my way is the only way. And so anybody else that is a business coach, if they're not doing my method, then by definition, they're my enemy. Mm -hmm. Their work doesn't have any value. There's a lot of that, which is just such a waste of time. (laughs) And I'm like, I could work day and night and there's no way I could ever meet the needs of all the people who potentially could use my services. Like I don't need to have a huge amount of clients in order to have a a thriving business. And so we need to have many people who are capable. There are many different kinds of people that need different types of support. Um, The place where all, you know, we're all chime in sometimes or have a point of view is if somebody is utilizing a business model that is, oppressive by nature, that's manipulative, that's using tactics that are really not respecting folks um, that I don't like or support. But in general, I'm happy that there are so many great folks out there who are doing the work. I know it keeps me on my toes um, working with so many people. We're often, we have the same clients who might approach both both of us to work with us. So it's like, I better have, have myself together if, you know, if I know that they're talking to my colleague, because I know how good my colleagues are at the work that they do. Yeah. So if someone is not feeling the abundance mindset, if they're Mm -hmm. getting a little bit scared and feeling like there's not enough room Mm -hmm. for everyone, do you have any advice for those people to get out of that space? Fear in body of work, the chapter that I wrote on fear was called surf the fear. And I've always had, including an escape from cubicle nation. And now the work that I'm doing for the widest net for the next book, fear is um, a protective force, I think for us. And it helps to indicate areas where we need to pay attention, vulnerabilities we may not realize we have. And, but it's that very like gut reaction kind of you know, lizard brain that's reacting to something that's perceived as being a threat. So first to know that if you are healthy, you absolutely have fear. I forget, is it sociopaths that like have the total absence of fear, you know, so <laughs> that, right. it's, it's not always, <laughs> I don't remember the exact term for it, but, you know, not ever being afraid of anything mm-hmm. or having like no fear whatsoever that you may harm somebody else or harm may come to you. Um, I would be a little bit concerned if somebody in my life said that. Sure. That said, when you are able to really listen to the fears and write them down and figure out what exact messages are there and what feels really true for you and what feels like something that really is just a thought that's causing you to feel emotionally anxious that actually when you just maybe frame it a different way is not really scary. Like that's the work of discernment as you begin to look at evaluating what are real risks and concerns? How do I build a plan around those things that are? And then how can I begin to go through a process of creating more helpful like reframes for thoughts that are really not really not true where like the thought we have that's causing us fear is not true. What I see a lot in the coaching world, and so this is where I just love that we have discernment and we talk with each other as coaches, is sometimes people just, somebody might have a fear that comes up and immediately coaches just jump in to just 
turn the thought around and just to like immediately have people say like, no, you shouldn't be afraid at all to be vulnerable. No, you shouldn't be afraid to, you know, to quit your job, to start a business. I'm like, are you kidding me? You should be very afraid, yes. very afraid. And then you should figure out like what you actually have to be concerned about and you make a plan and you start to act little by little and then you don't feel so afraid and then you can actually build it. But it's having that partnership, what I call surfing the fear where like you feel it, but you start to, you start to work with it. Yeah. Um, it just over time it in, in befriending it and respecting the fact that mm. it's there to protect you yeah. is, is really helpful. Yeah. I've started a practice of every time I feel fear, I thank it. I say, thank you, fear. Thanks for showing up. I know you're trying yes. to protect me. So I yes. really appreciate that. What's the message that you have for me? I'll think about it. I'll, like you said, I'll come up with a plan. <laughs> I, I talk to my fears all the time, too, all the time. right? Like treat it like a beloved, mm -hmm. you know, relative who's there. I mean, and sometimes <laughs> the fears are in the form of our beautiful family and friends, right? Who are actually saying things out of their mouth. Like you are an absolute fool. Why would you quit your job to start a business? And it's with that same loving compassion, you know, help me understand what you are concerned about, where I know that you want me to be healthy and stable financially. Um, I respect and appreciate that. And I take your feedback you know, wholeheartedly. And then I'm still going to be doing things that I feel like are in alignment with my plan. Yeah, absolutely. A friend of mine likes to refer to her anger as her drunk uncle. And so she, <laughs> she's like, Oh, my drunk uncle's here. So I'm just gonna have a little conversation. <laughs> <laughs> that's perfect yeah growing up the adult child of the alcoholic like I can totally relate yep. to that one yeah it's like okay I hear that you're upset right now I'm just gonna pull this glass away and we're gonna talk about this <laughs> that's right yeah absolutely so you're working on a book right now mm -hmm. what is your biggest challenge with this one um this one, it, I'm from where I am right now. I am in the 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 fun zone. So Good. I've been working on this book for about the last six years, and I okay. have generally the ideas for a book. It always comes from whatever work that I'm doing. I begin yeah. to notice patterns that emerge. I begin to notice things that my clients are asking for, ways that I might start to share the framework or a metaphor, and it starts very fuzzy. Um, as just a sense that there's something that's there. Like it has like a little spirit, you know, it's like a little distant Casper the ghost that's bouncing around in the corner of the room. And for this one, I, I very specifically did some things differently where I um, did a 23 city tour in 2015. I called it the Unbook tour with a little nod to my friend, Scott Stratton from Unmarketing, where I really had some general... Uh, put together really the model that's the foundation for the book that I had used for many years about building audience and building community both online and in person. But I wanted to take it around to places where I had done book tours before to get input and really just figure out what were the areas that were of the most interest to people and you know what were the things that jumped out at them. It was a little bit of a scary thing to do to go out with less formed ideas, but it was so helpful to do that. And that really led me to then test and try with putting um, together the model for the Main Street Learning Lab here, we really use the model very specifically in the development of the book. And so I was living every day and also doing the work with clients every day to be implementing the tools in the work we're doing to grow their business. But it is, it took a long time to really get it shaped into a book proposal. I worked yeah. with my friend, David Muldauer to do that with me. And then to take it out to market and notice, interestingly, at this time, <laughs> as much as we know that we do all need each other, that people need to be, that, but really the premise of the book is um, how it is that you can really have a very clear way that you can find a much larger audience than you ever thought possible for your business or your book or your podcast, very systematic way that you can begin to analyze and look at um, where audiences hang out and just mm -hmm. a lot of audiences that you may not have thought about before. Yeah. And then what are ways you can, in a very relational way, build relationships and begin to, you know, connect to me. I was like, what do we all need? We need a method for doing that because so many businesses have been devastated. So many markets yeah. have shift shifted, mm -hmm, but mm -hmm. it's just the way I think that it is in the publishing world where 
Um, sometimes it's like, you know, for me, it's a third book. So my first two books were critically acclaimed, which I'm so thankful for. And a lot of people love them, but I'm no Brene Brown in book sales, you know, unfortunately. So I don't have these gigantic sales numbers where everybody's just excited. You know, there's, there, and there are things, reality about being a 54 year old woman, right? And particularly a white woman today with good reason, publishing has gotten a lot of heat about the lack of representation with authors of color. So mm -hmm. in many ways, I'm like, yes, I 100% agree. That's a core of the work we do here at the Main Street Learning Lab. So it, it really took digging deeper to find the right kind of publisher, I think, that got the, you know, that got the book yeah. and wanted to do it. So going through that process of like really pulling together the idea, having the research, um, now I get to write it. And now I'm like super excited about it because I know it works. I know it works. And I know how much my, my clients need the tools. I'm so excited to be codifying the pieces of it that I think are going to be so useful. Um, writing can be hard. And I have four and a half months, like from today's date when we're recording the podcast. So it's going to be, it's going to be a bit of a clip in order to yeah. do it. But I really feel like well, I say that now, but the hardest part is parts are behind me for this particular book, for what it's taken to get here. So how do you keep that discipline of just writing? Is it like you, you schedule it in or what, what are your tricks to make sure that the writing gets done? I do schedule it in. Mm -hmm. And um, that's really important to me to, to have the time to do it. Charlie's um, create, connect, consume is actually really important for me because I generally, when you'll, when I'm working on things, I will rotate. Now I physically rotate here in the next room in the Main Street Learning Lab. We have a huge wall that's all whiteboard paint. Mm -hmm. So I might, sometimes I'll be writing and then I need to like see an idea visually. So I'll walk over and I'll like scribble things on the whiteboard wall. And then I might bring my laptop over and, you know, write them down in words. So I've given myself permission to recognize that um, in the writing process, it's not all just sitting down at the keyboard and yeah, typing. Yeah. And of course you get closer to, it's important to get the words in. And, and I found that I just start to, to, as I have stories or ideas, just to throw them in to, I use Scrivener is the, the tool mm -hmm, that I mm -hmm. use to write. And so I'll just like throw them in those different sections. Like, so you have a little bit of a starter, you know, a little starter pot yeah. <laughs> um, um, in order to just not like open up a chapter that's totally blank and have something to work with. But yeah. as it gets closer and, and it gets to that point of like really needing to be pulling all the stories together, that's when it begins to shift into many more hours of just sitting and writing and writing and writing, you know, but the early stages are like, I, I've learned that if I'm beating myself up for not just sitting down and writing straight, if I haven't conceptually gotten the pictures, it's not going to work. I'm not going to be putting things together the way that I need to conceptually. Yeah. You're kind of a social scientist as well as a writer, it sounds like. It's, it, I've begun to realize that it's funny. Yeah. So many authors you always hear, I respect so much friends and people who are authors that, you know, talk about their, you know, the research and the research they've done in a book. I was always like, I want to do research, but then I did realize like, I, this is, <laughs> hmm, what have I been doing is, all this time? Do? That's right. I mean, we did some specific research projects. We did an actual attitudinal segmentation survey as part of this for this book, but just working day in and day out with real people and trying these things on um, with real business owners is to me the thing that that gets me really excited. And I can, uh, you know, sometimes I have my cynical judgy moments where I'm like, man, it would just be easier to just make up some cool idea uh -huh. <laughs> about a model that sounds really sexy and throw the F word in the title and, you know, <laughs> just have it be a massive bestseller. But I just, I just... <laughs> Like I'm never going to write about something that I have not tried in the real world with mm -hmm. real people where I know it works. And as yeah. soon as I get that, um, then, you know, it just, it just can take a little bit longer. So this is a storytelling podcast. So I'm just going to ask you, is there a story that you'd like to share on this theme of collaboration, either from yourself or someone that you've worked with? 
You know, I think one of one of the stories that I'd be telling in the book is mm -hmm. one of my, I hate to say favorite clients. It's like my kids are always trying to get me to say which is the favorite kid. And I'm like, <laughs> you're, none of you are favorite. Forget about it. But one of my very beloved clients, Heather Krause, is a data scientist in uh, Canada and Toronto. And when we first started working together, um, she is amazing. And she wanted to develop a whole part of her body of work, which is a particular framework and a method for evaluating bias in data. So it's really looking at data equity and coming up with a method where she could be training other data scientists to be identifying and removing biased ways in which data is collected and shared and so forth. Just such a cool initiative. So she is a very self-identified introvert. She, we were just we were just talking yesterday, and she said um, when we were talking about you know data and um, like working with people in community because she's gotten so many connections. She's like you know I'm an introverted scientist. Like I would rather just be working with data all the time, but I recognize that relationships are such a critical part of data science. Yeah. And so in the work that we did very specifically, I can't wait to share the story as a case study because in, in helping her to make those connections initially to be doing what I call tiny marketing actions and like reaching out to other people who were really interesting to her, who were doing other kind of related work in order, you know, once she built the platform for We All Count, which is weallcount.com if you want to check it out. But once she started to build that, we had to work this very specific process of she would literally say like could you help me craft like the words in the email in order to reach out to somebody because mm -hmm. i choose like i just don't i don't see the world that way and it feels totally foreign to me and so it was so fun and rewarding to work with her and to watch her as she began to get some some just good natural ways to reach out to people to have conversations yeah. to notice how things begin to grow and have momentum in her business. Now it's like a huge snowball that is just, it is amazing to see like where she is at today in a relatively small period of time. But what I love about it is that she showed me so clearly that the things that I just took for granted about what are the smallest details and nuances in what it takes to build authentic connection. And I, I, she really helped me to just codify it in a way that somebody who didn't naturally see the world that way could actually use it and feel natural, right? After a while to yeah. do it and get the same kind of effects. So it's just so, it's so wonderful to work with her and then just to kind of see where she is and to know the journey that we took. And she's very self-deprecating and hilarious. And, you know, we just laugh so much about the different parts of like getting very, very deliberate about designing these pieces of how to connect. Yeah. I used to be a dating coach a long time ago, and I specifically worked with people who were on the spectrum <laughs> because they have a really hard time catching flirtation and messages and understanding what these things mean and how they're supposed to respond. Yeah. It seems very obvious to us, but their brain works differently. <laughs> and so it was really, that was such a rewarding and fun thing to do to help people just codify, you know, yeah. oh, this is what it means when they say this, and this is how you respond in a way that's going to, you know, come across this way. So I, I totally get that. It's really fun when your gifts just fit so nicely into the spaces that somebody else yeah. just needs. It's so, that's why we all need each other. Like we, yeah. you know, we'll, we'll say that sometimes during calls. It's like, just to see for me to see how my work has had an impact, like seeing it implemented in a way in which like, wow, this really works, like really works. And it, conversely for her to have that feeling that she couldn't have done it without some of that very specific work that I did. So it's just really, yeah. it's so neat to have that kind of connection. Yeah. That's really something that I wish for everyone listening, that you will find that gift that just feels so good to give and that people yeah. really find value in. And you can just have those experiences where it feels, it doesn't feel like work to you. It feels like fun. And yet to this other person, it's like, oh, oh my gosh, how did you do that? It's like magic. 
It is. It really, it really brings you to like another dimension. And there have been so many times where, you know, I, I'm just amazed. I'm just amazed sometimes at the kind of things that can happen where, and it's, you don't always know. You don't always know when you start to work with somebody exactly, you know, what that fit's going to be. I think it does require lots of openness and lots of really listening and being open to the other person. That's one quality I notice, <clears throat> and for myself as well, to really deeply be listening to the client and understanding how it is that they're wired and really respect and admire those qualities and not just come in with a predetermined view of what it is that I think that they should do. But it also takes the client really being willing to be open and to try new things. Absolutely. So I usually end with an exercise where I kind of take people into their kind of ideal future, but I suspect that you are a person who has a pretty good handle on like what makes you tick and what you prioritize and are probably pretty happy with the life that you've kind of got going on. <laughs> so I want to, I want to take you through a slightly different exercise if I may. Good. Yeah. Let's, let's, you can close your eyes or open them as you okay. uh, prefer, but I'm going to wave my magic wand and I have now made the business world better. Mm. There's now more collaboration. There's now more openness. There's now more listening. There's more people just using their hearts as well as their heads. I want you to just describe for me what this new kind of ideal business world is like. Mm. It's fun. <laughs> um, <clears throat> it feels physically good to go into businesses and establishments and workplaces in which the work mm. is being done. Um, there is far less uh, stress and um, ill, you know, headaches and ill health and just mm. like not feeling good there's I think there's there's a general generally more like well-being and just any yeah. meaning any kind of specific stress related illnesses that can come where people just might feel you know anxious or pain in their shoulders or you know headaches or the pit in their stomach you know irritable bowel syndrome like things that you hear of all the time for people who are yeah. in a situation where basically it's completely you know fight or flight um, and then really specifically, which is a whole desire and goal of me is to just see a total shift in the leadership and to see folks of color in leadership mm. positions, especially women of color, especially black women is my personal love and desire of working with a lot of black women founders and just noting what a difference that is when we're really able to connect with strength that is coming all throughout our society and our workplace and just with folks who have always had so much contribution but have just had so many like systemic barriers I just think so many things would be different more creative mm. more engaging more liberating for everybody for everybody in a system where uh, where people feel free and where it is that they're able to collaborate and really have you know empathy and connection with each other so that it's a world I dream about. It's a world I actively work on happening as much as possible in my local community. That's a big part of what we do here is just highlighting the leaders of color when there are opportunities that are coming, making sure people know each other, recommending people to be speaking on panels, um, just doing as much as possible, just you know, supporting political campaigns where people are running just so that we really see um, people in positions of leadership. And um, it, it makes such a big difference. It just makes such a big difference, I think, in how joyful, free, creative, and innovative we can all feel. Because if some of us are not free, then I don't think any of us can be free. Yeah. So I want you to just feel that for a moment, that that is real now. That has come to pass. There's diversity in the leadership. There's creativity. There's freedom. There's that, that growth mindset that you were talking about where people are really focused on process and not product. And can you just see that rippling out into society, into the world, into people's family lives, their home lives, just see that ripple effect 
of that wellness spreading out from these businesses. And how does that feel? It's wonderful. It's, I just feel like a whole like melting of so much stress and tension that is held in individual bodies, inside family homes, inside workplaces, for everybody who is in that kind of system. I've seen it up close in person for so many years. And, and it's, it is hard to imagine sometimes what it would be like, but I know we get glimpses of that from what it is that we see here, you know, here we have gatherings and yeah. um, it, it's what we always tell our kids, like, you know, life is just too short to be <laughs> creating drama, to be not doing what you want, to be living wrapped in shame, to be, you know, it's just, oh, we just have this one, we have this one shot and we have no idea how long it is that we have. And so um, I really, it seems like <laughs> the promise of it is so great that everybody would just immediately jump to doing it. But it's like, we know with every kind of change, it really has nothing to do about the fundamental soundness of an idea or how good the promise is. It's how committed is we are to trust the fact that we, you know, we have each other's backs and we can change in such a way that we will survive the change. And that's, uh, it's a pretty tough nut to crack right now. I mean, understatement of the uh, century for 2020. <laughs> but you're doing your part, I know. I'm doing my part. That's, that's what I've learned that for me, I, I love to look at the big picture. I stay tuned into what's going on, but if I just look at a generalized anxiety over things that are happening, it just starts to pull, you know, my own vibe down. And um, I don't, I, I just get really fearful and stuck. And what I just look at every day is what can I specifically do in the lives of my clients? What can I do in the lives of my community? And what it, what is happening here in our case in Mesa, Arizona, where there's, it's just a really cool, it's like a, 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 a playground of activity that are happening. We have so much growth and development happening, but also so many opportunities to be very deliberate about how it is that we have conversation. So like just being able to, you know, raise my hand sometimes and say the uncomfortable question that nobody really wants to hear, but like <laughs> needs to be said, or, you know, call for the meeting that like nobody is asking for input, but like once we start to get into it, you realize that, you know, things can shift. And like those, those are things that just bring me huge, tremendous joy. Like yeah. it just, I have energy all day for doing that kind of thing. Absolutely. So I want to end on, on this note. So, um, you said, you know, deliberateness, having those, those difficult conversations with kind of deliberateness. I had a difficult conversation with my daughter this weekend when mm. she brought up to me, she said, mom, I don't know how to stop fighting with my sister. She has this little mm. sister and the two of them have just been like at each other's throats. And I think a lot of people are dealing with this because they're stuck at home you know, it's really yeah. hard. They don't have a lot of social interaction and they're stuck with each other all the time. Yeah. And so she said, mom, how do I stop fighting with my sister? And I said, mm -hmm. well, why do you think you fight with her so much? And she said, well, it's because it's fun, I think. And I said, well, then why do you want to stop? And she said, because I think it would be more fun if we could get along. I just don't really know how. I said, okay, well, maybe just try being really deliberate about it. If you're going to be argumentative, like do it on purpose, have fun with it, right? Mm. Like disagree with her strongly and clearly and enjoy it, right? But yeah. then if that's not bringing you joy, try the opposite. Try listening to her point of view and lifting mm. her up and tell her she's right, you know? And she was like, huh, okay. And for the rest that's of the- That's some great parenting advice right there. That's so amazing. Great. Yeah. Yeah. It worked like a charm. So- you know, whatever you do, just do it deliberately. Just decide what you're going to do and, and just do it. <laughs> it doesn't really matter what it is. I totally agree. I think that's brilliant advice. I really love that a lot. Yeah. So where can the folks at home find you? Um, I am at PamelaSlim.com is my main site. And that's where you can jump on my newsletter. If you want to, if you want to get kind of a monthly update, I usually write features on what's going on with my clients and 
some kind of a topical newsletter. And then once we're able to move freely around the country again, hopefully sometime in 2021, <clears throat> it's also a place where um, you can find out like where I'll be traveling for the book tour. The, the book's coming out October in October, 2021. So um, I know that I'll probably, hopefully where all is safe, uh, be doing events. We're actually going to have, I already have decided <laughs> down to the last song we're going to sing is a sing along together oh, about I love my it. book launch party here, which will be here in downtown Mesa, <laughs> where we have the greatest playground ever. And I already oh. have people like committing to fly in from all over the country for it. It's going to be the party of the century and so <laughs> much fun. So that I have already planned. I just need to write the book to make sure there is a book to launch. <laughs> but, um, but that's that's a way to kind of stay in touch with what's going on. And I would love it if you connect, if you want to stay in touch, that's a really good way to do it is on my newsletter. Awesome. Thank you so much for being here. Thanks for having me.